So before I start my presentation, and because my nice podcast is up, I do want to mention I have some stickers, which always seems to do good with developers. So if you're really interested, let me know. I have, I don't have enough for the whole room, but I have some. Why do you have to switch in? Yes. Mm. Ah. You have to take out this one. Just close Safari, sorry. Uh, where are we? Yeah, I should have done this for you. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Wonderful. Here we go. Um, welcome all. Well, not welcome. You've been here for like one and a half days. Um, but there's a few more talks left, and I'm very happy to talk to you all about solving the 15 puzzle in Swift. Um, looking at algorithms and speed. And this is not the first time this has happened to me, where I come up with a title and then really like looking into what I want to talk about, it's like, does this really reflect what I want to talk about? And again, in this case, it didn't really match. Um, so it's more of looking at algorithms and performance and maybe one or two other things and we'll see where, where, we, where we're heading. And then also I just got like, are you introducing yourself? And I was like, oh, I don't really know if that really helps. I guess you already now know what podcast I do, but I will tell a bit more about myself as well. <coughs> um, I work in the iOS platform team at Xing. For the Germans here in the room, they probably know this company. Uh, it's a professional business, uh, professional uh, social network um, looking at the German speaking market. And I work there in the platform team, so I m work mostly on foundational APIs and building, like the building blocks that help the other developers and feature teams work on features. I run a bi-weekly newsletter that's called the Weekly Brief. <laughs> <laughs> Long story. Um, and that covers or gives an update every two weeks on everything that's been happening in Swift open source and all of its related projects. And then, as you already saw, I do a podcast uh, together with a colleague of mine. It's called Contravariance. We talk about Apple, we talk about Rust, we talk about Vim, we talk about things we do outside of work. Uh, it's a lot of fun to do and it's nice to see that some people also listen to it. So before we get into how to solve the 15 puzzle, what is a 15 puzzle? I don't know if everybody knows. Maybe hands up, who knows what the 15 puzzle is? That's not that many people. Well, luckily it's not that hard and maybe when you see it, you will actually think like, hey, I actually do know this. Does this ring a bell? Okay. So this is the 15 puzzle. Hello. This is the 15 puzzle, but not really, because like this, it's not really a puzzle. It's already solved. So why don't we shift it? And while we're at it, why don't we solve it? So we move five up, we move nine to the left, we move 10 down, we move six down, we move two left, we move three left, four up, eight up, and we move 12 up. And we're back where we started. So that was easy, that was my talk. Thank you all for attending. It was also quite speedy, so. Well, actually. All right. Let's try this way. Okay, cool. Before we start looking into how we solve this, uh, I want to start with a bit of history. And this is not history on this puzzle, or it's history about me, kind of. So contrary to what you might have thought, um, this is more of a story as well, rather than a deep dive into how to solve this thing. So I'm a bit sorry. But we will also get to quite a bunch of code and you will, at the end, have some idea of how to solve this thing. TVOS. Does anybody still remember that? 
outside of the people that live in the US and maybe have some more functionality. I actually realized that it was four years ago that I started with this whole project and only now I'm giving a talk about it. Um, it was four years ago when tvOS came out and I liked this puzzle and it was like, well, this is a cool thing I can build on tvOS and then I can build it for iOS too. Right now we have the option to do the same for iOS and for tvOS and for macOS so you can do even more, but this was the start for me to do, to do it on both uh, OSs. And what was really cool about it and at the same time also not so cool. What I remember was I got so stuck into this problem that it was like 3 a.m. In, in the night on like, you know, a, just a week day. And I was like, oh shit, I've been working on this for hours. Um, but it was a lot of fun. So back then, I wasn't looking at solving this puzzle. I was looking into like building this puzzle and have people solve it. Um, and it looked like this. And then we have a beautiful GIF of something that might remind you of MC Escher that implements this puzzle and lets you solve it on tvOS. And that was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to work on. But obviously, I got stuck like any other side project. Uh, there was some iOS issues porting it to iOS. And then I was like, well, I also want to write this like solver, but I don't know how. And I kind of gave up. Good thing though, I learned that UI Collection View is really cool and houses some very, very cool APIs that allowed me to do all this magic and not that much code. But we'll talk about that another day. Fast forward to January of this year and after those hiccups on iOS and like any other site project, at least for me, I tossed it away um, and in January I thought of this again. I don't know why. I think I came across the puzzle and was like, well, maybe it's time to write the solver. And I wanted to challenge myself to do that. Um, and it sounded like an interesting problem to solve. An interesting puzzle to solve, you might say. And to learn about writing a solver and diving into algorithms and optimization and mathematics, the possibilities were endless. And when I was looking into how to solve this puzzle, I think I realized one thing that I hadn't really anticipated, but in hindsight was really obvious. This is completely different from solving this puzzle yourself. You're going to have to throw all of that logic away, all of that knowledge away, and figure, okay, what if I can't, you know, see and do whatever I would do and add my logic to it, but let the computer do it instead? Um, so that was really, really an eye-opener and I was super excited to start with this. Um, but that wasn't all because I didn't really just want to write a solver given input A, you know, solving the puzzle giving me output B, but I actually wanted to see, okay, what are the steps that are getting, that are, that are getting me there and how does this solver actually work? What does it look like? And that's kind of what we've already seen when I showed you initially from a scramble puzzle to solving it. And I also realized at that point that I hadn't written any Swift code in more than a month. So it was also fun to start with that again. So with these challenges that lay in front of me, I had to start somewhere. And we can start with the solution. I mean, maybe that will be all that we need. Obviously it won't be, but hey, it was a good start. So looking at this, um, I started writing more of a generic solution that would give me all of these steps that were necessary to get from point A to point B and report on it. And what we see here is a simple, or at least we see a struct that is generic um, over uh, a problem and the problem has steps. And it looks fairly simple, but what we can already tell here, or what we can notice, is that it's a nice abstraction on a simple array and gives us some type safety and makes it easier to read this API going forward. And what we also see, and this is something that was mentioned yesterday as well by Roy, is we have this precondition here. Um, don't fear, like, 
writing a precondition or making yourself aware when something goes wrong. And we will also see myself actually felt like not using some of the rules that Roy used, but for good reasons, hopefully. So we have our solution and it's a bit unwieldy, but we, it's generic. So we have a solution over int and we have steps from one to two to three. And we can look at these input and output and well, that's nice, but we still want to do more. We want to look, loop over this whole array. And that's simple because you can loop over an array, but you don't really want to loop over the array. You want to loop over the solution type. So for that, we are not confirming, <laughs> but conforming to collection. And luckily, that's pretty straightforward to do. So we have our uh, solution and we conform it to collection. And there's only a few things that we have to implement. Start index, which we can just rely on from the uh, array that is backing this solution. End index, same thing. The subscript, same thing. And for the index, we can also rely on the arrays index. So we're basically just similar to uh, what Daniel said about lifting something. We're basically just lifting the array uh, functionality to the type itself. And then we can loop through the solution in a very nice way and print every step. And you might be saying now, it's like, okay, but now what, right? Like, okay, we can model this solution, but we're still not looking at any code that might even start to solve this problem. So what I wanted to do for myself is get an overview of, okay, what do I need to do? Where, where do I start? I have my solution now, but how do I actually solve this puzzle? So, especially because it was a project that I was working on just on my own, what I wanted to do is communicate with myself and get an overview of, of everything. So, this is pseudocode, um, but we, we're going to have our board, which represents our, our puzzle. Um, we're going to have a position that we'll delve into. We have our tiles, which is either empty or a number. And then we have a bunch of functions that we'll uh, look closer into, like a next that takes the next best step. Um, we have our swap, where we swap the tiles. Um, obviously, we solve the puzzle at some point, And we also want to shuffle it at the beginning. And there is some more, but we'll, we'll go into the most important ones. So before we start looking into the, the functions, why do we need this position? So the position is again um, an abstraction on the part, like the the part of the puzzle we're referencing, one of those tiles, um, or the position of the tile rather. And it's an easy way to abstract some of this logic that would probably like grow in complexity when we don't wrap it in a type. So we have our position that it's, you would say, similar to a point where we have an integer for the row and we have an integer for the column and we have a helper function uh, that checks if this position is adjacent to another position on the board. And this is where it comes into efficiency and um, speed where what we're doing in this is adjacent is we're checking if any position that is um, on this board. So we get the adjacent positions to self, which could be two to four positions. And we're checking if any of these positions are there. And if they are, um, then, well, we have an adjacent part. If they aren't, we don't. But what we have is we have one filter that loops over the whole array, then checks if it's empty, and then we have our result, which means looping through the whole array. So we can make a small improvement here where they first were, where we will only loop through the array until we find our element that matches, and then we have enough information to return, okay, this is not empty anymore. So instead of looping through all of the positions, we only do so until a match is found. And you could say this is magical. We already like improved our uh, efficiency here. And it actually isn't. 
I would say it's magical that it's not. It is, if you look at it, rather simple to understand that we can make a change here and that we are looping through the whole array and we don't have to. And it's really great that we have all of these expressive functions on collection to make these kind of improvements. So let's look at tile. This is another piece of abstracting away a rather, well, finicky type with just int um, and making it sure that it's expressive when we have an empty tile and when we don't and what number that holds. And obviously Swift is really nice here where we have our enums with cases with associated types that we can use. So we have a simple initializer here that takes an integer um, and we also can get the integer value which we will later need to actually solve this puzzle. And for the empty tile here, we use a minus one, which might remind some of you of NS not found. Um, not ideal, but it does the trick. So it's almost time for the real deal and actually looking into solving this thing. Almost. This is the initializer of our board. What a monstrosity. Two-dimensional arrays are still my enemy and will always be. And this is also why flat map is so nice if you can use it. In this case, unfortunately, we are going to have to deal with a two-dimensional array. So let's look at this code and see what it does. First of all, be your own friend and crash early if this is not a valid piece of code. Actually, this is something that Foundation does all the time. If you use some mathematical functions and you pass in a bogus value, you'll probably trap. But we don't do that, right? We pass in correct values. Obviously, we want more than one row because if we just have one row, we have just one number and nothing can change and our puzzle is not a puzzle. Then we initialize our board, which is this two-dimensional array of tiles, and we set it to empty because we want to loop through it and actually populate it. We loop through the amount of rows that we have, um, which for the 15 puzzle would be four. And this is like this one tricky thing where we just add an empty array because we want to populate that row with a column and so forth. So when we loop through, again, our rows, because I mean, it's a square puzzle, um, we do a lot of magic here, and it's hard to read actually because we have like row times rows, which is actually a different thing. Um, some complicated logic. This is something we could definitely improve and add some comments to later. But what we're doing here to explain it is we take our row, which is our current row, which would at the start be zero, multiply it by the amount of rows we have, four, which still would be zero. We add our column, which is initially also zero, plus one. So this is basically allowing for the array uh, indexing at zero. We want our number to be starting at one. And then in the case of uh, an empty, we append the empty tile, and otherwise we add our number. All right, so with this all out of, out of the way, we can look and start thinking about solving this which means thinking about algorithms. But what makes me think about, or when I think about algorithms, I take the next step and I think about speed and I think about scale and I think about performance. And then you can still question all of these. Um, specifically, one of the things that is good to keep in mind is scale. What if we have a puzzle that is not four tiles wide, but 100. Will we have issues solving this? Will we see that our algorithm isn't efficient? And this is something that is really good to keep in mind. But what I actually want to look further into is performance. What is performance? I think many of us think about speed, about doing something efficiently, doing something quickly. But when we look at the definition, it's just doing something accomplishing something. 
the execution of an action. And that made me think maybe it's not just about speed and about scale. Performance, like I said, is more of a mindset where it's something to think about, to keep in the back of your mind and to be aware of when you want to look further into something you can optimize or when you have an issue to work on it. Or even better, to spot a performance problem and verify that you don't have it or do have it and if you do have it, fix it before it can become a problem. So with that in mind as well, we can ask the question again, where do we start? Or where do we continue, rather? So, again, we start with the solution, but part two, the solution of actually fixing and solving this puzzle. And the way we do that is what we said before, we want to return the steps, so we return our solution of our board. So every board is a step. And we just repeat while we don't have the puzzle solved. And we call our next function that should look into, okay, what is the next best step? And hopefully then it will be solved and then we return the solution. And we make it, we add a, a nice thing as well with the discardable result um, where we don't always care about looking in the, into the solution. Maybe we just want to solve it, especially when it comes to connecting this to your UI um, so we can safely ignore the result if we want to. And the compiler won't give a warning. And if you have warnings as errors, it won't give an error because of whatever reason. So next, we have a big function that is not even completely implemented. Um, and that is figuring out adjacent, adjacent positions to a position that we pass in. So imagine that we have our solved puzzle and we want to see what, like, if we want to start shuffling it, we need to know which tiles we can move and which positions they are at. Um, so to go through this, let's first look at what positions do we have. Um, so we take our initial board, because we don't really care what our current board is, positions are, are there like they are. Um, we flat map it, very nice, we don't have to care about the two-dimensional array, and we map it to a position for this, uh, uh, for this tile. Then we have some magic, we'll go into that, but again, we help ourselves with preconditions, and we verify whatever should never happen, let's make sure it never happens, and if it does, well, we crash, so that basically means we can at least never return from this. So looking at the puzzle as well, again, like we have our empty tile and it can only be a tile on top, below, to the left and to the right and not more. Like that's weird. I don't know what kind of puzzle that would be. Maybe if you make it 3D, don't do that. Um, so we verify that. And then we also all, always have at least two. So if it's in the, bo uh, in the bottom right, we can go up and we can go left. So let's look at this questionable magic that is happening in between. Honestly, this might look daunting, but I love this code. I love how I went through this and figured out where I can you know, make, uh, make it easier. And looking into this, we have the fault through where we only really have one uh, thing we need to check for. Um, so first of all, what we do is we loop through our position where, um, but, but we loop through our position, but not the one that is the current looping position because, well, we can't move our position to itself. Like that doesn't really do anything. So small optimization. And then we have all of this logic that checks, okay, if this is the position uh, above, or the position to the left, or the position below, or the position to the right. If we have that and that matches, then we can we have a valid adjacent position and we can add it. But before we add it, we can also verify that, hey, we can't add the same position twice. And again, this should never happen because we're looping through the positions, which 
shouldn't contain duplicates, but it's nice to have there. All right, almost there, looking at how to solve this. Before we do that, we need to shuffle. We need to mess it up before we can solve it. Um, so we also have a shuffle function. We want to move it however many times. So we can make it really simple by only moving two blocks, or we can move it more. First, what we want to do is check which positions are adjacent to our empty tile and we can move. So this is the function that we just saw. And, and we leverage that here to see what tiles are adjacent uh, to the empty tile. And again here, should already be verified by the other function, um, but we double check that this does not return uh, less than two options. What we do next is um, we uh, remove the previously moved tile. So this is a variable that's outside of this function that we store because Imagine we move two to the right, and then the next step moves two to the left again. Doesn't make sense. Um, so again, a small optimization there to make sure and make it easy to see that, hey, this is something we thought about and we want to uh, get rid of. So how we do that, we check our adjacent uh, to empty uh, tiles, and we filter that to like remove anything that is the previously uh, shuffle tile. At that point, we take a random adjacent tile and then uh, we move that one to like move that one to swap it with the empty tile. And then last we set the previously shuffle tile to this tile that we just shuffled. All right, so like I said in the beginning as well, this whole movement from solving the puzzle yourself to doing it in code really like, needed some rewiring in my brain. Um, because it's completely different and you have to start somewhere else, etc. So I looked at some videos and I found a nice algorithm that I could use called branch and bound. And that helped because that was completely different from doing it myself and I had some handlebars uh, to start working on this solution. So what the hell is branch and bound? Um, basically what we do is we look at what options do we have? What are the adjacent tiles that we have? Is there a best option? So if we move any of these tiles, like what is the best uh, next step that we can take? And then do it again. So the idea is to branch, look at all the branches that we have in a tree. What are all the options? Is there a best option? Bound to that, do it again. So that's what we're going to see. And we're going to dive deeper into our magical next function. So first of all, what we do is we copy our current board because we're using structs, questionable. Um, but we're using structs, so we're copying our current board so we can verify uh, and use that later. And we check again what are the uh, tiles adjacent to, or the positions adjacent to our empty tile. And then we have pretty much an own function within this function uh, that we could abstract if we want to. And what we do here is we check those adjacents to empty, and we map it to our own function or our own uh, types that we need to verify later what the best next step is. Uh, so first of all, we return our whole board because this is going to be interesting to know the next step for our solution, where we actually want to know what board status we have. Um, we passed the tile that is being moved, and we pass the amount of valid positions that we have after this potential move. So looking at the implementation, um, we check the tile at position because we move tiles, we don't move positions. Um, we move that tile, which is tricky because we're using structs. So we have a defer that actually resets the board after doing this. And then we return our new board, we return our move tile, and we return our valid positions, which is, which is a computer property that verifies the amount of valid positions. 
And then again, what we want to filter is the previously moved tile, because again, we don't want to re like move left, move right again, because that's never ever going to be the next best step. Then we want to get a list of all the valid positions or the amount of valid positions that we have. So this will return an array of, well, for example, seven, nine, and seven, which we will later see. And then obviously nine valid positions is the best step, so we will take that. We check that there is always a maximum there, which will always be the case if it's not empty, which is verified because we will al always have at least two positions to move to, well, minus one because it could have been the previous position. Um, but it's nice to double check. And then what we need to do is figure out, okay, what is this best next step? Uh, so we filter and say, okay, what is the uh, this position with the largest amount of valid positions. So what is what is the next best step? And then we take um, the best uh, step index, which is the first index uh, where the valid positions is equal to this first next best step, because there could be multiple. There could be two options that give you the best like the same best next step. And that's something I won't go into because this is obviously something you want to optimize for and actually verify like without just using branch and bound to know, okay, what is actually the next best step? Because there is only one. And maybe you even have to do some more magic to figure out uh, what that is. But it does the job. And uh, again, we have another check. This should not be nil, we should have an index to move uh, to move next to, and then we do that. We move our, uh, we take our option, we take our board, and then we replace our current board with the new one. And then also we store our previously, uh, our previous next tile, so we don't move back and not get anywhere. So I want to give you an example, which is similar to what we had in the in the beginning. If we take this puzzle, we have our empty tile between 13 and 15, and that's something we want to, you know, we want to move something. So what we want to check is what are our adjacent positions? Well, it's 13, 14, and 15. That was easy. So with these valid positions, if we move 13 to the right, we have seven valid positions. If we move 14 down, we have 9. And if we move 15 left, we have 7. So here we see, and if we go back, what we want to do is move 14 down. That's the next best step. So we do that, and we repeat. We again ask, OK, what are the valid positions? Or what are the what are the adjacent positions? What are the valid uh, amount of valid positions after doing that? Uh, and repeat, and that's how you solve the puzzle. So some thoughts: be your own best friend and fail early, and maybe even do it too many times. So at least whatever piece of code you look at, you see that this has been thought at, uh, thought about. Um, but this will never happen, a famous quote, I, I hear it all the time, I say it all the time, make it so. Break up the puzzle in pieces, um, which is also kind of funny because we already have a puzzle with pieces. But start somewhere and figure out how we can break up this, this, salute, like this problem space into many different small problems. We have our solve, we have our next, we have our adjacent positions. Start somewhere. and. Do try to get to keep an overview of what you're all looking at. Start somewhere. And make your quote-unquote edge cases uh, explicit. Let the compiler help. We've looked at abstracting the code so that we can make it easier to know, is this an empty tile? Because minus one doesn't really tell us it's empty. But that's just an underlying, uh, like, underlying thing that we don't have to look at. We express empty and we express our tiles and also with the position we wrap our integers so that we have a nice row and column 
API. And that's how you sold the 15 puzzle in Swift. Thank you very much. All right, uh, I give the mic over there. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the next best position. So, from my understanding, when you really, really scramble all the numbers, so you can't really evaluate from the next position if that is the next best position. I don't know exactly how you do this, but I mean, it could be that you have to do some, some, some changes to actually get the right number to the right spot. So, how exactly does the is it, is it limited to a specific amount of uh, changes that you did beforehand, or is it like working all the time? Or This implementation, good catch, is not working all of the time, um, because that's what we went into. We just take our first index of our next best uh, position. But if we have multiple like next best positions, we might end up in an infinite loop and actually not solve the puzzle. So you will need to add some more heuristics and figure out how we can leverage like more knowledge to, to figure out what the next best step is. All right, uh, the front or in the back, whatever. Just Daniel is here. Yeah, just move the microphone to the front. Yep. So two questions. Is it is it definite by getting the next best you'll move quickly to the solution, or is it sometimes better to go backwards and then? Because it isn't a complete like uh, solution to every like problem space that we have, so we can't solve the puzzle in all occasions. This is not the best approach because it doesn't solve all the cases. Uh, so yes, in some cases, in some more complex. Uh, situations of this puzzle, you will need to add some more heuristics to figure out how to solve it, which means this isn't the necessarily the, the optimal solution to the puzzle. I guess it's similar to the progression of chess solving algorithms. Where would you put a look ahead in here so that from each path you're looking, if I follow this path, and, and have, you, have you looked at doing that? Yeah, that's one of the ways we can, we can do it, or we can use the Manhattan distance uh, as well. Um, but the look ahead would, would be a, one of the options. So you have less possibilities. So you could actually check all the four and go always one further. Yeah. So the question is if we can always like look one ahead, right? And we could do that, and that might help uh, prevent some of the, the like uh, boards that aren't able to be solved with this algorithm. In the back. Did you ever have the chance to have a look at this reinforcement learning techniques to solve this puzzle, like Q learning, policy iteration, the things that Google is doing for this Alpha Zero, for example? Because it can solve this, I mean, it's going to have a solution then, and above the performance, it has been shown that it's easily able to beat this kind of algorithm. Did you have a chance to look at it, or? I haven't had a chance to look at that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's definitely something that's interesting, and it would also be really interesting to try and solve this puzzle in multiple ways and then compare like what the advantages and disadvantages of the, the algorithms are. And the solution, when it finds a solution... Just hold, hold the, the mic fastest? like this. Of, if this, your algorithm finds a solution, is the fastest one actually with the least amount of movements, or you don't benchmark it either? So the question is if this is the fastest algorithm? Yeah, if it finds a solution, in case that we find a solution using this algorithm, is, are, is it guaranteed that it's the fastest one? It's not guaranteed, no. Okay. Unfortunately. Okay. Okay, great. A lesson on mic holding, always this way, <laughs> for anybody. Um, yeah, I think we're good for now. I just have a couple of words, but first of all, we will give Bass a round of applause.